So we already talked backstage, so. You missed, you missed yeah. it. Yeah, That's sorry. <laughs> um, where do you want to start? You know, do you want to start by talking about the, mo the first clip, or do you want to start talking by talking about just, I don't know, like what was the first movie you ever saw? Um, Mary Poppins. Well, I saw all kinds of kids' movies, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I saw a lot of sci-fi movies in Akron on yeah. these double bills. The first really adult film I saw was in a, a drive-in in Florida on vacation with my family, uh, which was Thunder Road, yeah. Robert Mitchum wow. directed film. Okay. It's kind of weird, I don't know yeah. why. <laughs> but I, I'd like to start just by saying, you know, this was very daunting for me because Kent asked me to do this and to pick clips from films Wow, I mean, I could have picked like 200, and uh, I didn't even know where to begin. So I, I was trying to think, well, maybe I should just pick uh, only Westerns, or only black and white Westerns, or maybe only film, crime films from 1967, or maybe <laughs> only black and white crime films from 1947, <laughs> or, you know. So it's such a, you know, it's such a beautiful thing, the, the whole, I don't know, span of cinema, and, and so it was hard, and then I, I made notes of about, I narrowed it down to about 50, uh -huh. and then I, I narrowed that. that down and gave, you know, I gave Kent about 30, I don't, no, I don't 20, know. 20, 20, 20. So anyway, it was, it was a little hard, so, um, well, we just have a few to show you. <laughs> And then I was thinking too, you know, well, I'm a... And we can allude to those. We talked about that, to the ones that yeah, are not... if we have included. time, if yeah. you... But then I was thinking too, you know, I'm a, I'm a film nerd, but then Kent is, and I mean this in all respect, is a bigger nerd than I am. <laughs> so he knows so much about yeah. movies that it's, that's also a bit daunting. And then I was thinking about how I talk slowly, and like, if Marty Scorsese were here, you could go through five times as many films because he talks so fast. <laughs> so this is like right. the slow-mo version. We once did yeah. a great thing where I got to interview Marty on stage for a long time at the Silver Docks Festival in DC, and really it was like, well, what about... <laughs> I think that's really great. <laughs> so, the audience's heads were spinning. So this is kind of slow motion, whatever we do. <laughs> well, we picked a kick uh, A kick-ass beginning, for yeah. the beginning, yeah. yeah. Maybe we do should you just roll You want to just roll it, yeah. Let's do the first item. Yeah, Samuel Fuller. Um, I know he said once uh, something like, if the first page of the script doesn't give you a hard-on, throw the thing away. <laughs> It's kind of a metaphorical narrative hard on. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't really <laughs> do that for me, but to each his own. And he used to, instead of saying um, action, he would fire a gun yeah. with, with a blank in it. He used to fire off a pistol yeah. instead of calling action. Richard Widmark, when, when they made Pick Up on South Street after like the fourth time, he's like, um, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, this is from 1964, The Naked Kiss, at Constance Towers, and uh, it's a pretty incredible film. It was not one of Sam's favorite of his films. Um, I think, I'm not exactly sure why, but it's so Fuller-esque and so visceral, and photographed by the great Stanley Cortez, yeah. who uh, photographed Night of the Hunter, and the Magnificent Ambersons, Chinatown. No. So, yeah, he photographed Chinatown. John Alonzo. What? Chinatown? The, the sure. Polanski movie? Yeah. No, John Alonzo, man. Really? Okay. See yeah. what I mean? <laughs> anyway. But well, he wanted to photograph <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, Chinatown. but they wouldn't. <laughs> uh, but um, it's a really... He shot Chuck Corridor, too. He the, shot Chuck Corridor. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the film starts with Constance Towers coming to this town, Grantville. She's a prostitute. Here she's beating up her pimp over 75 bucks. I really... I like his excuse about, cut out, Kelly, I'm drunk. <laughs> I often use that one, yeah, too, when I'm not. getting beat up with a high heel. But, um, <laughs> and then she, uh, you know, the local cop, like, tries to force her into a job in the town as a, a, at the local whorehouse, right. you know? But she refuses and works for uh, a children's hospital as a nurse. That's right. 
And yeah. then everything looks really nice, and she's going to start a new life, and she's going to, uh, her fiance is a really reputable guy in town, and everything seems really like a little pastry, but, but there are maggots inside, you know, because her fiance turns out to be a pederast, and she ends up like murdering him with a phone receiver at the end, yeah. so. It's, it's very, I guess, visceral and Fuller-esque, for sure. It's extremely visceral. Made on a but very I love the op opening, a film like this. Who, who could do that besides Sam Fuller? Made on a very, very low budget. Right. Yeah, like it's many guy, of his films. You the know. guy who had, but who had been also had A budgets for, you know, like Pick Up on South Street and stuff like that. And yeah, when Fuller filmed um, Shock Corridor, at the end there's a scene where inside the asylum it's, it's water is leaking, it's raining indoors, and mm -hmm. he, uh, he filmed that scene last and flooded the set. He, he totally flooded it and destroyed it so that the the executives couldn't make him shoot a different ending because everything had been destroyed. He did right. that purposely, and because uh, he had very low budgets, almost always, and yeah. one of our really great filmmakers. And you, you, you knew Sam. I bit. knew Sam. Yeah, yeah, I'm so lucky to have to have known him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're, when did you meet him? In the '80s. I first met him in the late 70s, and yeah. then I got to spend time with him uh, through various things, and then I ended up uh, especially getting to go and be in a film that Mika Karasmaki uh, made. Tigrero, right? Yeah, where we all went to uh, Brazil and, and into the Amazon. Mm -hmm. But I remained friends and remained friends with his family, and uh, I just love Sam Fuller. Mm. And that's... <coughs> I think, I'm not sure if you're supposed to, I mean, it, I think the way that those, that the image looks now, you can see him pretty clearly pulling the wig off. If, for anybody who hasn't seen the movie, did you record, did you see a guy suddenly <laughs> appearing in the middle of the frame pulling her wig off? Doesn't the pimp pull her wig no, off? No, it's Sam. It's oh, really? I don't know. I couldn't see from this angle. But yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen the whole film in a lot, quite a number of years. But yeah. He's just kind of reaching in and pulling it off because it's supposed to be ah. you know, kind of like a magical effect, but it's, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and, and why this one as opposed to, say, 40 Guns or, you know. Because, Kent, it's a good way to open the show, <laughs> you know. It's a, it's yeah. a hard-hitting, um, Sam Fuller at one point got a, an award in San Sebastian for yeah. a humanitarian award. <laughs> And he walked up to the podium and said, uh, he said, this isn't a goddamn humanitarian film. It's a hard-hitting, action-packed melodrama. I think, it, I think it was Shock Corridor. He said, save your, save your award for somebody else. And he walked off without <laughs> accepting the awards. I think he also, in his autobiography, said, you know, if you want to make a real movie, you know, shoot at the audience with real bullets. <laughs> a real war movie. Yeah. Yeah, what a character. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to... Uh, moving on? Moving on. Do you want to move on to the next clip? Or? Yes. <laughs> this is, now, we have, we have little uh, paired clips here, Yeah. I think, coming yeah. up, uh, many of them. So this is a paired clip. Yeah. And in b but, but maybe before we go into the paired clip, we could talk, invoke maybe some of the other... Um, I mean, you had mentioned before that you were thinking of like all black and white westerns from 1947, and one of the films that you chose that you talked about that we're not doing is uh, Blood on the Moon, right? Um, by Robert Wise. Yes, it's a Robert Wise film um, <coughs> that with Robert Mitchum that is a, a western that's shot very much like, a, well, for me, film noir is very a specific period, you know? It doesn't really, for me, in a purist way, it doesn't extend into the 50s when Don Siegel and others started shooting more on locations yeah. and using natural light. And to me, really, noir remains very uh, connected to expressionism and yeah. very kind of carefully, I mean, there are real locations in many of the films, but uh, mm -hmm. it's very moody and a certain kind of style. and. Blood on the Moon was a Western in which uh, Robert Wise, who is an incredible, uh, varied director, kind mm -hmm. of underrated, maybe not so much anymore, but Everybody's an amazing now. Uh, yeah. filmmaker. And um, 
and Blood on the Moon is a kind of a noir western. And uh, there's a really incredible scene early on where Robert Mitchum has to climb a tree because of a cattle stampede. So there's a high angle shot I wanted to use, that sequence where he's in a tree with the cattle, um, just wall to wall cattle filling the screen going under him, which is very striking. But yeah, it's, it's a strong film. I also, we were gonna talk about um, Johnny Guitar, Nick Ray's Western. And you were thinking about putting it together with Rancho Notorious? Yes, uh, Rancho Notorious, uh, Fritz Lang's uh, Western with uh, Marlena Dietrich, because these two films are, to me, the most like Brechtian Westerns. They're almost as though characters are carrying big signs saying Western, <laughs> because they're not uh, in any way historically accurate. They don't intend to be. Nick Ray's film, uh, Nick Ray studied architecture actually with Frank Lloyd Wright and he designed the sets, all of the buildings. They do not look like Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, in fact, one would wonder if he actually <laughs> studied architecture <laughs> because it looks like a cheesy ski lodge or something. And all of the wardrobe and everything, uh, it's with Sterling Hayden and uh, Joan Crawford. Like and a dude ranch or something. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and the way they dress, it looks kind of like I don't know, it's very 50s, yeah. and there's no pretense of being accurate in yeah. any way. Yeah. And I know that Nick Ray, you know, he was in uh, experimental theater groups in the 1930s, Bertolt Brecht slept on his couch when he first came to America. And, yeah. uh, so anyway, I thought of those two, but, but, we, but we don't have time, so we're <laughs> talking about them anyway. But you, and you studied with Nick Ray? I no? did, I was Nick Ray's kind of uh, assistant personal gopher assistant the last years of his life, yeah. uh, 1978, 79. Yeah. And I got to uh, be on the set of uh, Nick's movie, or Lightning Over Lightning Water, Over that Water. Vim Vendors made, but I was the only person there brought by Nick, because Vim brought all the, the crew. Mm -hmm. But I was Nick's uh, assistant, meant go get him whatever, you know, whatever he needed. And uh, mm -hmm. while he was in the hospital dying, I, I stayed in his his loft in Soho, because his wife Susan was with him in the hospital. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I learned so much from Nick Ray, and I've learned, I, I kind of go on too much about this, but one of my tenets of my job, you know, one of my things is that I am a self-proclaimed dilettante, and that I'm very proud of that. It's not a negative thing, and Nick Ray, you know, he did uh, radio shows of, of rural blues and Appalachian music in the 30s. He studied architecture with Frank Lloyd Wright. He painted, he read voraciously. He knew a lot about films and the history of cinema. And mm -hmm. he always would tell me, you know, if you want to make films, don't just watch films. You know, look, get your inspiration from everywhere because films, filmmaking has everything in it, yeah. you know? It has music and style and ti you know, timing and rhythm and acting and writing and photography and color and composition and you know, it has everything in it. So, and studying just human nature and emotions. So, he, you know, he's very, very important to me, Nicholas Ray. And uh, so, but to choose one of his films, I wouldn't even know. But, you know, Johnny Guitar was just a nice thing of these kind of Brechtian Westerns together. Yep. I think maybe one of my favorites, though, is In a, Lo is, uh, in a Lonely Place. Yeah, it's, it's in a way the most kind of maybe, uh, well, I don't want to say personal, but uh, I don't know. But it's a really strong, amazing film. Humphrey Bogart's greatest performance, I think. Incredible. And mm -hmm. uh, beautiful uh, Gloria Graham, performance by Gloria Graham. Yeah, and, and one of the most unusual films about Hollywood. Yeah, and, and a kind of nasty it. film uh, at its underneath, you know. Yeah. Yep. Do you want to dive into the next clip pairing? Should we do? Should we one? talk about the next clip? Is two films. Um, <laughs> one is uh, Il Sorpasso by Dino Risi, which is from what 1961. His teeth were like Roman ruins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could just talk about these two clips alone for like couple of hours. Yeah. I just love them both. Um, obvious parallels. Two guys together, mismatched on a road trip. Uh, 
record-playing machines in their cars, um, one very talkative character each time and one not talkative. Yep. Um, in the uh, in Aki's film, which is one of my favorites of his films, not one of his most known ones, Me but uh, I love it so much. And uh, Mati Pelenpa's character is an alcoholic uh, addicted to vodka and cigarettes and... Uh, the other characters addicted to coffee and cigarettes or cigars, and so they they have these machines in the car. He can make coffee, and they yeah. can listen to records in the yeah. car. And uh, it's a kind of interesting plot because later they they meet these girls, um, and it's almost like a faux porno narrative. Mm -hmm. in that they pick up these girls, but one's Russian and one's Estonian, yeah, right. and they can't speak with them at all, and the yeah. girls aren't interested in, in them at all. Yeah. But they end up going to like a hotel overnight. But of course, in Aki Karismaki fashion, nothing happens. Yeah. There's no connection with these girls really at all. There's yeah. just, for them, the possibility, but it's absurd because it doesn't happen. And uh, I don't know, it's just a very beautiful film. I, I, and Matty Pelenpa, I had the great chance to work together with him uh, on a film we made, um, Night on Earth, and uh, s several years before this. And he, he, we've, he's gone now, we lost him, but he was just remarkable. Mm. And so beautifully human, and I, I just love the dialogue in this film. It's great. It's beautiful, and it's a movie that's so swift, isn't it? Like an hour long, or a little bit. It's more? very short. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, seventy-five minutes, eighty Doesn't minutes. It starts with the other, with the cigar, the guy who's driving, just sort of like getting up and leaving. Well, he's house. in a house with his mother, right. and he's addicted, and she, d I forget, he needs more coffee. <laughs> right. That's he's a on a coffee Jones, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah. I forget how, I haven't seen it in years, I forget how they get hooked up together. It's yeah. similar though in, in Il Surpasso, which is a fantastic film, and I gotta say, uh, Marty, to mention Marty again, Marty, he and I were, loves that for movie. years, we were on the back of Peter from uh, Criterion, and Ma Peter Becker, Peter Becker and, yeah. and Marty and I were, because Peter, every time he'd see me, are you gonna tell me again about Il Surpasso <laughs> that I must put it out, you know? So we were on his back, and yeah. it's beautiful now on Criterion. Yeah, they finally DVD. listened, man. Jeez. It's a yeah. fantastic film. And uh, these two characters are just amazing together. Um, and it's really, if you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. Uh, it was a film, a film that was sort of out of circulation for a long time. Yeah, it was very reasons. hard to see. Yeah. I, I only saw it years and years ago. Yeah. And, uh, but... I know I keep name dropping these great directors, but I did get to spend quite a bit of time with Fellini when he was uh, making his last film, Voices of the Moon, yeah. with Roberto Benigni. Yeah. And often I got to ride to the set with Fellini mm. because Roberto was either sleeping in or I, Fellini is like, this ham actor friend of yours, he will be late again. <laughs> But I, I got to ride with Fellini and one day, uh, and I love this dialogue about Antonioni because Dino Risi and Fellini and Antonioni were, were very close friends, you know? And they were this new wave of Italian cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, once uh, Fellini, we were riding to like Ostio, I, I don't know, outside of Rome, early in the morning and we were both in the back seat and he had a sh chauffeur and he said, uh, you know, this is so embarrassing that I, I, I don't drive anymore, you know? And I was like, well, come on, you're on, on the way to work. He said, no, no, no. When we made our first films, me and Antonio and Dino Risi, do you know what we did when we got the money from our first films? We each bought a beautiful Italian car. <laughs> me, I bought uh, Alfa Romeo, and uh, you know, Antonio and Ferrari, and... Uh, <laughs> A Maserati for Dino Risi. <clears throat> this was, we were rich. <laughs> so he was really into these beautiful Italian, I just love that story. And yeah. now look, an old man <laughs> driving along. <you> know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, lo I just love this film very much and uh, I love that dialogue about falling asleep and, uh, yeah. during Lake Cleese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great director. And the two actors oh, yeah. together are fantastic, you know.
Yeah, that's a very special pairing between the two of them. The and Jean-Louis Trintignant, he just gets sucked into this guy because Rome, it's a, a holiday and no mm. one's in Rome. They're all out of Rome. Right. And this guy needs to call his girlfriend, Vittorio Gassman, and he sees like a window open with a guy and he's like, you, hey, can I use your phone? Come on. Right, right. I got to call my girlfriend. The yeah. guy is a law student. He's studying, you know, Jean-Louis Trintignant. Yeah. And then yeah. he comes up to use the phone and then he like talks him into coming with him for a ride. And then he, t he kidnaps him for the whole weekend. <laughs> and I don't want to say <coughs> the ending, but it's a fantastic film. Yeah. Did you see a lot of these? Um, when did you start getting into uh, becoming a dedicated moviegoer? Well, I, uh, I went to Columbia and studied, I was studying literature and I yeah. was studying like comparative literature. So I got to go to Paris for part of a year mm -hmm. in uh, 1975. And, uh, and I, I came back with incompletes because I discovered <laughs> the Cinematheque in yeah. Paris. And then, man, I was gone. Mm -hmm. I was there every day. I was like absorbing all this stuff I didn't know you could have all these films that didn't have to have a giant crab monster in them or, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> nothing against that. But, yeah, you know, right. wow, I saw films from Japan and films by Jean Rouge and films from India and, you know, my mind was blown. So yeah. that's when I really discovered, wow, cinema is as varied as literature, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, the I guess that that's a good that's a good lead into the next two clips because they're two films that have a direct correlation with one of your own films, right? What are the next two? Aren't they oh the yes, right. Yes, uh, the first is a clip from uh, *Le Samurai* of uh, Jean-Pierre Melville from 1967, and the next is from *Branded to Kill* from 1967 uh, by Seijin Suzuki. And they're both films about hit hitmen. Yep. Those are two. They're two hitman movies and two extremely quiet, concentrated hitman movies with an eye for different things than you usually see in a hitman movie. Yes, well, especially the, um, the Le Samurai, the Melville film, yeah. is very uh, about a very methodical hitman. Um, Who's a very schizophrenic, quiet. right? Yes, and he doesn't speak much at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, he, uh, it's a great performance of Alain Delon. He gets, uh, you know, he gets trapped between both sides, and in the end, both the police and the the gangsters that he usually works for are both uh, out to kill him. Yeah. So he's a kind of tra trapped, you know, mm -hmm. um, a beautiful performance. Uh, I love that his name is Jeff Costello. <laughs> um, Melville loved American culture very much. Uh, <clears throat> Jean-Pierre Melville was named Jean-Pierre Grunbach. He was a Alsatian Jewish guy from Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the French resistance. He, he sure was. And yeah. during that, he took the name of Melville for the American writer. Um, so he loved American culture, but often in his films, the gangsters drive big American cars through the narrow streets of Paris, you know, <laughs> yeah. and have names like Jeff Costello. <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, fantastic director, of course, uh, well, masterworks. Yeah. Um, this film's very beautiful, too, in that uh, you notice when uh, Dallon, or when Jeff Costello is leaving his apartment, Everything is gray, yeah. and he painted, uh, Melville insisted in this film that everything be painted gray. Yeah. Even the, on the street when he's stealing the car, mm. um, the other cars and the car he's in are gray, yeah. you know, and there's this grayness that pervades. So using a color film and, and reducing it to a lot of shades of gray. Yeah. It was really interesting. You and know? He was a genuinely independent, I mean, he owned his own studio. He was a real yes, independent uh, filmmaker. Yes, after the war, he wanted to become an assistant director, and he applied to, like, the union or something. He was rejected, so he just thought, well, fuck it, I'm going to make my own films, and he started making his own with his own studio. Mm. Very particular, because he doesn't really belong to the Nouvelle Vague, yeah. you know, and he... Even though he's in Breathless. Yes, and uh, yeah. 
Sam Fuller was a big fan of Melville, you know, so yeah. a lot of cross kind of references. But yeah, fan a beautiful film. Who and he and he hated Johnny Guitar. Who did? Melville. Melville. He yeah, did. I did. Th <laughs> <laughs> I think he Bertrand Tavernier was his assistant, and he I think Bertrand saw Moonfleet, and he came and said how much he liked it, and um, Melville said, "Okay, that's it. No one to speak to Bertrand." <laughs> for the next <laughs> six weeks or something. Um, and he was very, he, he very after he saw yeah. Johnny Guitar, he said we had to go watch uh, The Asphalt Jungle again to purify our souls. I you know. see. <laughs> well. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and he, you know, also um, Sage and Suzuki is very independent and uh, actually caused a lot of problems with the studio that he worked for, for his films not making enough money back. Or yeah. I think this particular film was very problematic. But uh, you can see, it's not a, it's not a gr the greatest clip because the film is photographed in the most exquisite ways, with in scope, black and white, with all these angles, uh, incredible. But uh, it's also a fantastic film of a, a hitman who's uh, there's a kind of contest almost going on of who's going to be the number one hitman, and this guy uh, is the number two hitman. And so the other hitmen are trying to kill each other to become a higher ranking hitman. And this, uh, uh, what's the actor's name, uh, Joe Sh uh, Sh uh, Shishido, he stuffed like rice into his cheeks to make his face look weird in this film. So he has a very funny, odd facial structure. But it's just an incredible film. Um, so many beautiful angles and se sequences, and very strange, very almost surrealistic, you know. But I, I, uh, I was talking uh, in, uh, I guess we were in Cannes, but with uh, um, Park Chan Wook, yeah. and he uh, told me this story that Suzuki once came to this festival in, in South Korea. And uh, you know they had a big retrospective, and then they were all they were all like, everyone was very impressed and asking him all these questions about the artistry of his films, and at the end of which uh, Suzuki said, "I think you have greatly misinterpreted these films. I made them all for money." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was an actor too, Suzuki. He's still he's still alive. Um, yeah. But an incredible character. Yeah. Um, anyway. And, there, and there's another scene in this film that has a more direct bearing on. Yes, I, I imitated uh, or quoted a scene where a guy shoots, uh, well, the main character shoots, assassinates someone up through a, a sink from a, a, a floor below, and he takes apart the plumbing and assassinates someone up through the drain of a sink, which I quoted very directly in uh, Ghost Dog, The Way of yeah. the Samurai. But also the scene that you chose from the, the Samurai of the, um, with the keys, there's something about the absorption of that scene that also feels very linked. To yes, and Ghost Dog Ghost begins Dog. with Ghost Dog stealing a car yeah. with a homemade uh, electronic device. Yeah. But this is very beautifully methodical of taking the keys off this ring and yeah. wondering how many is it going to take him to <laughs> start this uh, Citroën with. <laughs> how does that work for you? You know, I mean, it's a, a common thing to, it used to be a thing where people would talk about, you know, one film influencing another, the pr you know, you see the traces of one film and another film, but on a practical nuts and bolts level, aside from something like the, um, uh, the example of the drain pipe, how does that, how do you see that as a, as a filmmaker? Well, I don't very often directly quote other films, but I, uh, when I do, I want to be very open and appreciative of it. I, I love it when other people do. I like it when, uh, well, I know at first Quentin Tarantino didn't fess up to uh, Reservoir Dogs being a quote of the film City on Fire. Yeah. But, uh, but he eventually did. did. Yeah. But he's, I love Quentin Tarantino for taking things from other places. And, uh, you know, this is, there's nothing new with this. Uh, yeah. You know, the Magnificent Seven is from the Seven Samurai, or, uh, you know, Yohimbo is the basis of uh, 
a fistful of dollars. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, those are even taking an entire plot. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that because I think um, I expression in any form are, I've said this a lot, but for me it's like waves in the ocean that you can't really delineate, but they overlap. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't really believe in originality. I just don't really think, I don't believe it because there are a, a limited number of stories, but mm -hmm. there's an unlimited way, number of ways to tell them mm -hmm. by any, you know, so to tell the same stories over and over in different ways to me, well, that's my other, you know, my, my big things are being a dilettante and, are, and variations. Mm -hmm. I love variations. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, mm -hmm. I don't really believe in, I believe it is only theft if you take somebody's idea before they've realized it and say it was your own, right. and then you're just a full-on asshole, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but if you take something that's something moved, that moved you, that exists, and yeah. you quote it, or you imitate it, or you make another version, I think that's just beautiful. I think that's the nature of, of creating things, yeah. you know? Yeah. To say it's all your own, Sometimes you quote things that you're not even conscious of, and they're just in you. So sometimes you can take something from somewhere that you're not even, you didn't even know it until later, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, I, I, I love all that stuff. I, and I like you know, being very upfront if you quote something and take it from something else. I want to ask you, um, you've, used, you've mentioned, used this term dilettante a couple of times, so what is it, how would you define it? on your own terms? Well, uh, I, I think my job is to be a kind of receptor of things, and life is very short, and so I cannot just learn everything about one thing. You know, there are too many things that constantly in interest me, and, it, and they can, it can be like 16th century English music or mushroom identification or, you know, um, certain... Uh, anime from Japan or, you know, I, I don't know, there's so many things in, in the world that are incredibly interesting to me. So I, and because Nick Ray instilled this too in me that y y it's good to know about a lot of different things if you want to make films. And I, I find more and more filmmakers that I love, I sort of discover when I learn more about them personally that many of them had in very varied interests, you know, and it all feeds into making films. So I, you know, I love that John Carpenter makes his own scores, and I, I love that some filmmakers are painters, or they're, you know, they are interested in a lot of different things. So I don't know. I, I feel like that's my job to be a dilettante. <laughs> it's not a negative thing. That's a very beautiful uh, definition. Should My other thing, besides variations and dilettante, is that I consider myself proudly to be an amateur filmmaker, mm -hmm. and that I'm learning the form continually. I'm not, and I do it because I love the form, and there's nothing wrong with being a professional because th you do that as your job for money, and, but that's not how I look at it for me. I'm very lucky that I, I get to make films and I, I work very hard at it, yeah. but um, I, I acknowledge how lucky I am that I'm not working in a, a factory or, you know, I was, I have done things like that. I was in the American Sheet Metal and Aircraft Workers Union and uh, operated a hydraulic drill gun. I don't, you know, and there's nothing I'm not against. I'm just saying I, I didn't like doing that, so I'm very happy to, you know, I've done a lot of jobs, I'm not, you know, but uh, I'm very happy to get to do this, but mm -hmm. I do work hard at it, so. Mm -hmm. um, shall we go to the next? Uh, Let's go to the next, the next ones. Pairing. This, oh, this was my inadvertent pair up. Yes, right? this is Kent's thing. <laughs> <laughs> it came out kind of nice. It's very nice pairing. It's an, it, it works in a, in a weird, in a way, but not in a way that you... Well, it wasn't my meant. intended pairing, but I think it's really interesting, so... Should we just not say what the films are? And yeah. Then let the, yeah. Okay. Let's not. Let's, so Let's not tell them even afterwards. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you got that part. 
So they are boy meets girl. Boy meets girl, yeah. Right. yeah. That connects them. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first, of course, is John Borman's like, masterpiece, uh, Point Blank, that is adapted from uh, one of my favorite crime writers, Richard Stark, yeah. a.k.a. Donald Westlake. Yeah. Um, 1967. 67, again. again. Yeah. Um, Another Hitman movie, I guess. Sort of. Yes, well, it's uh, not a hitman movie as much as uh, a double cross, the uh, avenge, revenge thing where he was double crossed after a heist right. and his wife ran off with his uh, betrayer, which was played by an actor I love, John Vernon. John Vernon, yeah. Fantastic actor. And uh, Angie Dickinson is actually his wife's sister. So the film is quite complicated. The scene, you know, there's flashbacks involved and this whole scene is made by editing. And uh, it's interesting because the Buster Keaton film is not made by editing. It's made by camera setups and by timing for the gags to work. So in a way they're antithetical in that way. But um, Point Blank is a, just a, a really, a, visual masterpiece. Every setup in the film is incredibly striking and uh, great acting. I'm, I'm a huge Lee Marvin fan, um, so, and I love Angie Dickinson. I, I just love Point Blank. Um, I just can get absorbed in it. Like, sometimes I've, it's one of those films that uh, I, I've seen so many times that I'll, I'll just start watching and I'll just watch the beginning. Mm. And then, oh man, I can't, I'm in it till the end, you know? Yeah. Goodfellas is like this for me too. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I think I'll just watch the beginning and then no, no way, man, I'm just there. Yeah. But I, I, I love it very much. Um, and that was a tough sell with the studio, right, Point Blank? For yeah, it was yeah. rough and uh, John Borman wrote that uh, the film ends in a scene in Alcatraz and uh, um, Wow, uh, the studio executives came and John Borman didn't quite have the ending of the film yet that he wanted. He wasn't quite sure and he felt very, very pressured. Yeah. And Lee Marvin came to the set and was known to drink quite a bit, Every Lee Marvin. Yeah. But in this case, he just acted drunk. He was not drunk. And he acted completely drunk, falling on his face to the point where the executives were appalled and said, get him out of here, clean him up, and uh, w you know, you shoot tomorrow. <laughs> so, and Lee Marvin did this because he knew John Borman was stressed out and didn't have time and had all this pressure on him. Yeah. So he was really looking out for him. They were quite close friends. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it has Carol O'Connor in yeah. it. Oh, that's uh, right. Archie yeah. Bunker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and yeah, a great San Francisco I, movie. Right. A San Francisco movie, yes. Yeah. Uh, L.A. L.A. and San Francisco. And San Francisco, yeah. Right. A lot yeah. of L.A. in it, too. Yeah. And a lot of shots through glass, through windows, a lot yeah. of playing with interior, exterior simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of exterior scenes will be shot through a window from a car or mm. an interior, or people will be interior, and the camera will move from exterior to interior. Yeah. It's just a lot of surfaces going on, and uh, really an uh, incredible film. And it's beautiful to watch Lee Mervyn move, I mean, all the time. But in that clip, the way that he reels from the blow, from yeah. the pool cue, you know. Very interesting, like a, yeah. physically. Uh, the film begins with him walking, right. and uh, the sound of the, his feet, uh, footsteps reverberating in a hallway. Mm -hmm cutting to a flashback of a party at which he's drugged and passes out. And yeah. Really a great, beautifully, I don't know who edited it, but uh, whoever did is a master editor. Yeah. So that film's made in the editing. Um, the Buster Keaton is made in, in the camera setups and the timing and the, the, the physicality also, certainly. Um, Buster Keaton is one of my favorite American directors, for sure. Uh, this film was co-directed with Donald Crisp. It's from yeah. 1924. And uh, what's happened is he's proposed to his fiance and was rejected. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know if he proposed yet, but he was gonna, they were going to go on a trip. He wanted to take her on a boat to Honolulu. Right. And then uh, they somehow 
her father owns a ship and he's kidnapped by some spies and this empty ship with Buster Keaton on it mm -hmm. and, and the female character is just set adrift yeah. and they're alone on the ship. So yeah. it's, and a really interesting uh, footnote is that this ship, I don't remember the name of it, was uh, a ship that was going to be scrapped. Buster Keaton never had a lot of money to make films like Charlie Chaplin did. Mm -hmm. He often did everything in single takes, especially stunts that he did himself. Yeah. Whereas Charlie Chaplin could study them over and over and you know, refilm them, and Buster never could do this. Yeah. Um, and the ship was going to be scrapped so they could make this, they got the idea they could make this film all on this ship mm -hmm. um, because they were given permission to film on it. But this ship had been used to take uh, anarchists, after World War I, to take anarchists and degenerates so-called um, that had been deported and to take them back away from America, back to wherever they came from. <laughs> so that's what the ship had been used for, and then they got to use it in the film. But, uh, for the navigator. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I just, I love Buster Keaton for so many reasons. Um, I love the fact that he is often, you see how small people are in the frame. That it's, in a way, the antithesis of Chaplin, who I love but I don't love as much. I mean, Keaton, for me, is one of our greatest directors, and he doesn't push being human or, or, I don't know, empathy toward him. You find it because he seems so fragile in these landscapes always. And he also, this, this clip is a little bit unusual because Keaton almost never uses like anticipation in, in a scene or a, a narrative structure, you always are there with him at the, at the moment, you know? And this has a, a touch of anticipation because you see when, but you know they'll of course find each other there alone on this ship. But uh, I, yeah, I just, I love Buster Keaton so much. Um, I revisit his films uh, often, so. With, it's, it's interesting because when I think of, of your work, I think of the, um, and you, you're making the distinction between rhythm and setups, b th between Buster Keaton's kind of filmmaking and Point Blank um, as a film made in the editing. Um, I'm thinking of the outlier in, among your films to me is The Limits of Control, which feels like it's... More Point Blank in a way. Yeah. <coughs> but mm -hmm. my earlier films like Stranger Than Paradise is more Keaton in that mm -hmm. we didn't have, we had one setup for each scene mm -hmm. based on limitations mm -hmm. like, like Buster always had. Um, there's a fascinating story. Uh, Buster Keaton in the 20s, he, he was married to one of the Talmadge sisters yeah. who were very famous uh, movie stars and, uh, and he had a very bad marriage but he had built this beautiful um, Italian villa, Italian-like villa in, in LA. Yeah. And he lived there with her, but then he, he lost it in the divorce. And uh, he, anyway, in the late 20s, uh, early 30s, they, they said, okay, the studio said, look, all of your films, we are reclaiming the silver out of the copies of these films. <laughs> so they're all gone, you know? So all of these masterpieces that Buster Keaton created were, were gone. Yeah. And they were gone, and he lived his life until the 1950s drinking more and, and, and uh, just accepting that all of this work he had done will never ever be seen mm -hmm. until James Mason bought the house that he had lived in in the 20s. He took down a wall in a part of a screening room in this house, and in a, a walled up projection room, were pristine prints of Buster Keaton's films. Oh, yeah. And he found them, mm -hmm. and therefore, thank you, uh, James Mason, mm -hmm. who uh, appears in a great Nick Ray film, by the way, Bigger, Bigger Than, Than Life. Bigger Than Life, yeah. Um, yeah. Who's going to kill his son at one point in Bigger Than Life, and his wife, he says, well, Ab you know, Abraham was going to kill his son. <laughs> and she says, but no, but he didn't. God stopped him. Well. God was wrong. <laughs> God He's was going wrong. up the stairs with a pair of scissors to kill his son. But yeah. anyway, that's another story. Yeah. Um, so yeah. thanks to James Mason, uh, we have Buster Keaton's beautiful films. You know. mm. 
Just, you know, what if somebody else had bought the house and just trashed it? And, and, and torn down the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Torn it all down and built a new house. Yeah. No Buster Keaton. Yeah, what if it was Dick Powell? <laughs> what is this crap? <laughs> Get it out of here. <laughs> Melt it down for a new silver set. Um, and then, so the next title is the film that you had wanted to pair, that you were thinking of pairing with The Navigator. Yes, and, and I'll, we'll just in introduce it. Yeah. Um, it's a, a small film, the first film by Abbas Kiarostami, who we just recently lost in a kind of tragic way, unnecessary way. But uh, he also, I know, loved Buster Keaton very much. And, uh, and also, uh, Kiarostami is very very often has some humans very small in a big landscape. That, and so the fragility of people in landscapes, uh, I know, comes in part to him from Buster Keaton. But this is a very a short little film uh, with a child protagonist, uh, the, actually his first film. It's called um, Bread and Alley. I'm not sure what year it is. Uh, uh, but an, anyway, yeah. it's, a, 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 it's just a little film about a boy trying to get home through the back alleys of Tehran with a loaf of bread. Yeah. He's trying to get it home. He's maybe five years old or so. He's very small. And he's frightened of dogs. And it, it, he has to navigate past a dog in, on his way home. And it's very, I don't know. <laughs> the whole drama of the world for Kiristami, he reduced to this beautiful thing of this kid trying to get home, this adventure, just trying to get this bread home. Yeah. And the, the clip we'll show you is uh, when he, he's afraid of the dog, so at one point he sees an older man walking along, so he f figures he'll walk behind this man and then he'll be protected from the dog, but then the man makes a turn and then he's stopped again, you know, with no protection from the dog. So yep. it's just a little clip of this, this moment. Yeah, I love this little film. Um, the it's, simplicity of it is so... Yes, and just reducing the, the world to this, just this little journey that he has to make, a very mundane thing for yeah. a, a young, very young human. Yeah. That's problematic, you know. It's very, I don't know, very moving. I love it. And it's the simplicity that he kept in throughout his his career, really. I mean, you know, and, and where's the friend's home? Just, you know, another child trying to, you know. Well, it's a tradition in Iranian cinema to use children as protagonists because um, to get around censorship, mm -hmm. you could have children, um, stories about children more easily than that to deal with metaphors of the world mm -hmm. than having adults, and that was more problematic with censors. It's still problematic, and uh, one of the great directors, Panahi, is still under house arrest, I believe, and uh, yeah. I love uh, Gobadi, too, a Kurdish Iranian dir uh, director. So many amazing films from Iran. Yeah. Um, and the quality of the clip was, was not, not as, although it looked pretty good, but I should say that all of um, Abbas's films, the short films, some of his most beautiful movies or shorts, um, are all being restored now by MK2. Yes, so they're coming. So sorry we don't, we're, they're not here yet or we would have had a better quality yep. image. So the last clip is something that you chose for a very particular reason, I guess. Uh, well, it's a film called Sword of Doom, a Japanese film from 1966, uh, Kahachi Oka Okamoto film. Um, it's, a, it's the most nihilistic film I think I've ever seen. It's very, very brutal. And uh, it's about a sociopathic samurai who kills a lot of people just because he feels like yeah. it. And, uh, it's very particular. It's um, a film I used for a personal reason um, over five years ago. I, I quit smoking. I'd smoked since I was a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I cordoned myself off for like the first week of stopping my nicotine 
uh, delivery systems, you know. So I, uh, I w well, I did two things. I, before this, I read a book, uh, the, the Easy Way to Stop Smoking. That, that helped me immensely, and yeah. there is no easy way. But right. I, I was ready, so. Mm -hmm. But I needed, uh, you know, I, I was totally alone for a week. I didn't, you know, and I stayed home. And what I did was I watched Sword of Doom like twice a day because, <laughs> because you know, you get, you're really tensed up and angry, you know? And uh, this relieved so much pressure. So uh, this, you know, and I learned from this book, you should never ever tell, the book is very good. Uh, Alan Carr wrote this book. And uh, the book's very good because it tells you, don't ever tell other people to quit smoking. And don't tell other people what to do, you know? But if they ask you, like, how did you do it, or they, right. they want to, you know, tell them what you did. Mm. But if you just go around telling people, don't smoke, you're just another asshole, you know? <laughs> and it's also what makes people smoke. Like, yeah. these commercials on TV that show diseased lungs and stuff, <laughs> man, smokers leave the room. They go outside and have a smoke, man. That's <laughs> upsetting, you know? It doesn't work. Yeah. So anyway, and, and I, I'm not telling packs, anyone you know, what yeah. to do, but, but this <laughs> film, since we're talking about films, this film was very useful to me, and uh, <laughs> it's very, it very brutal. There's a part in the film, for example, where the main, this main sociopathic samurai, he's going to have this like um, sword-style duel with another guy, and the guy's wife tells him, Look, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give myself to you sexually mm -hmm. if you let my husband win. You know mm -hmm. the sword contest. So he he takes her up on it, but then kills her husband anyway. <laughs> it's like you know, it's just <laughs> it is just brutal, you know. And yeah. uh, the end, we're going to see the end of the film, and it, the, it's very it's a predecessor of a lot of martial arts films, especially like. Shaw Brothers films mm. and other films that came later. This is from 1966 because this is a scene where the character fights and kills just an absurd number of adversaries. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and this became, this is a tradition in martial arts right. of scenes where, you know, main character kills like 30 yeah. people or whatever. So it's a predecessor of that too. It's an, and it's an interesting film. It's kind of beautifully made but it is shockingly brutal and nihilistic, and it helped me quit smoking. So I <laughs> thought we'd take a look at the last scene of this thing. <laughs> now that guy is a badass. <laughs> twice a day. Yeah, I'd wow. watch it twice a day. I got, because Criterion had it on a DVD, I got it, and I was like, yep. I'm gonna pop that thing in again, man. <laughs> You know, once around noon and once in the early evening. Yeah. You'd sort of doom, you know. Here we yeah. go again. Yeah. I think it'd be a new book. A new I felt so much better, too, <laughs> after each screening. <laughs> so, that, yeah, um, we can close out by just, through a couple of other titles that um, you had mentioned. One was The Foreigner by Amos Poe, and the other one oh, was yeah. uh, Pull My Daisy by Robert Frank and Alfred Leslie. Yes, I mean, these films were really like formative for me, and I, when I was you know, first starting out, before I'd made my first film, Permanent Vacation, I was, uh, I'd seen Amos Poe's The Foreigner, I had met Amos at CBGB's, I, um, Eric Mitchell was always around, and I sort of followed those guys around, the two of them, for like a year, you know? And uh, I, I just loved what they did, and I loved that Amos Poe made his film The Foreigner by taking out like a car loan and uh, shooting it all on the streets of New York with no permits of any kind, and just getting his friends in the film, and making really what was, <coughs> I don't like these kind of categories, but really kind of punk rock movie of, of that period, you know? And. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I love that film, and uh, it really, Amos Poe means a lot to me, and Eric Mitchell, too. Yeah. And uh, so I kind of wanted to show a scene from The Foreigner where Eric Mitchell, with his short hair dyed blonde, uh, running through the streets of the city, and they were shooting from a car, and uh, 
black and white, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, Pull My Daisy, Alfred Leslie and Robert Frank's film um, from, wow, a decade and a half before that, mm -hmm. uh, 1959, I think, is a fantastic film with also getting Robert Frank getting his friends to be in the film, uh, Allen Ginsberg and Larry Rivers, and, uh, and the film is, was shot silently and then narrated after it was cut by Jack Kerouac, who was drinking, Robert told me, a lot of very strong Apple Jack and mm -hmm. just kind of improvising the narrative yep. in a very beautiful Kerouac way. Um, so I love that film too. These films just made me realize that all films aren't made by Hollywood professionals, you know, and really opened the, those doors for me. There are others, of course, uh, Jack Smith, you know, there are other filmmakers that don't come from Hollywood. That really meant a lot to me. Jack Smith, I, I love Jack Smith. Mm -hmm. um, I used to see him a lot with a baby carriage collecting things, interesting things off the street. Mm -hmm. And once he gave me a, a business card and it said, Jack Smith, exotic theatrical genius. <laughs> and uh, I was so honored to have this card from Jack Smith. You know? yeah. So, you know, a lot of interesting filmmakers, but, you know, Robert Frank and, and, and Amos Poe, those two would have been an, another nice pairing for mm -hmm. me on a kind of personal, inspirational way. Mm -hmm. But you know, I could do this twice a week for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, and tomorrow night, we'll be showing you know, <laughs> only Japanese films Abbott from the Castello 1950s <laughs> with female protagonists. You know, uh, I don't know, and to, to do this with Kent is a real honor, so I thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank, thank you for coming, Jim. Thank you very much. I'm just blabbering, I don't know. But thank you for coming. <laughs>